So let's talk a little bit about the semantic web or having computers understand more like human beings do. The semantic web comes from Tim Berners-Lee and Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor of things such as the WWW, the Wide World Web, URIs, he thought up the concept of HTTP, HTML, XML, and now the semantic web. And he's been working on presenting the semantic web and getting people to understand it for several years now. So here's the big idea. What Tim Berners-Lee is, is proposing is a web that will evolve around a collection of knowledge. It allow people to add what they know, as well as to help people find answers to their questions. The unique thing that will be about the semantic web was, is that it will use a structured form. It will be able to be read by people and machines. Here's the big picture. This shows the different layers of the semantic web. Uh, some of these you know already and some of them we'll cover in this presentation. But on the very bottom is Unicode and Uniform Resource Identifiers. And that's like a nameplate for everything that's going to be uh, captivated on the web. The Unicode is a common uh, code language. It, it gives a, a computer number to literally every character for every written language in the world. Now on top, on top that Unicode base, and that naming convention is XML. And the scheme is that everything that goes with XML. And XML is going to be the common language that connects everything together. Using XML, the, schem the semantic web will use RDF, which are triplets that connect different objects together. And we'll cover that more in a little bit. Then with the RDFs, we'll be able to build an ontology or a vocabulary with basic rules. That'll tie on top with logic. With logic, we'll build on proofs that will know how things work. And you can see that those four layers, the RDF, the ontology, the logic, and the proof, they all form a digital signature. So you know that a document is what it says it is. And that brings us to the top layer, which is the trust. And we'll cover each of these and we'll come back to this big picture at the end of the presentation. So here's some examples of where the semantic web will really uh, be seen right away. Right now we have information that's available on the web as say weather reports, weather information, uh, flight times, uh, uh, departure and arrival, sports stats. TV, movie guides, all this information is on the web and it's very easy to see, but it's very, very difficult to use. If you go out to a sports stat page and try to, to scrape off the information, you'll find that it's exceptionally difficult to get the, the data you want from the sports page so you can utilize it in a different form. Um, a similar example would be calendars. It's really hard to pull out information from an online calendar and repurpose it for other information. Now Google has changed this because they've added an API or another layer where you can get information from a Google calendar. But if you were to write your own calendar, say in HTML or XHTML with some JavaScript, it would be very hard for people to pull that information and reutilize it on their cell phone or uh, their portable devices. And why not just Google? You know, people say, well, uh, the web is fine as it is. Um, I can find anything I want if I do the right search string. But basically, when you're doing a Google or any other kind of search, you're basically just doing a phrase matching. So you're saying, which documents contain these words or phrases? And that's it. It's really a very low level, very, I'll say, stupid or uh, unintelligent type of searching. What the semantic web does is it involves more involved questions, relationships, uh, trust. And instead of word matching, the web will be able to show how different things relate to each other. You'll be able to see new relationships. Things like, how does the weather affect the stock market? How does the weather affect crime or birth rates? 
um, you'll be able to find a lot more related material and see things that you never thought of before once you, the semantic web is in place. Now we're going to we're going to look at the RDF structure, but to do that, first I want to talk about how our brains organize various types of information and resources. Um, just think about how we track information now. We we can have online calendars, we have desktop calendars, our we put stuff in our address books, we do to-do lists, we have all the stuff out on blogs and web pages, and for those we can do Google searches, and then. Everybody we know uses the sticky notes and they put them everywhere. Even something as simple as a bookmark allows us to track information and get to it quickly. Now, how do you teach something like that to a computer? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use an RDF, which is a resource description framework. This is basically like a, a, tri, a triplet, they call it, but a very simple sentence. Jane sells books. You see Jane is a subject. The verb or the predicate is sell, and the object is books. So we have the three things. So here's how we can teach a computer to remember things in relationship to each other. Using the RDF, or the Resource Description Framework, we can take any objects, such as a person named Jane, and connect this object to another object, let's say books. And the connection is an action, in this case selling. So the RDF triplet, Jane Sells Books, connects Jane and books together in a specific relationship that a computer can remember and work with as data. In a few slides, I'll show you how this is done using XML markup language. Now, I'm going to go through each of these three pieces to show, talk a little more detail how they work. And the first one is the R in RDF is our resource. So a resource is anything that has an identity. Uh, in this case, it'd be Jane or the book. Now, how do they get their identity? Well, they can be identified with a URI, a Uniform Resource Identifier. Now, not all resources are retrievable across a network. If you put a URL in, that will get a web page off the network. But a URI is just an, an, uh, an identifier. You can think of it sort of as a namespace that's used in the XML language. Um, examples of a URI could be a government agency, a human, somebody's pet, or even an abstract concept such as love, marriage. The second part of RDF, the D, is description. And you can think of description as just a container holding everything all together. Or it could be even holding several triplets. So if you ask a friend of a friend what Jane does, they would probably say, oh, Jane, she sells books, specifically if she knows which Jane you're talking about, which is where the URI comes in for the computer. So you use RDF triplets, you could ask the same question of a computer and it would tell you Jane sells books based on the triplets stored in its database or its memory or out in the network. The last part of RDF is framework. Now this is a structure that is set up so the computer can make decisions to determine that when we ask about Jane, then the answer, Jane Sells Books, comes up. Now, English, a natural language like English, is much more complex and constantly changing. So an English framework is, is constantly on, uh, being adapted. For example, the word anime did not exist as a word in the 1980s as common usage, but nowadays anybody that you say in English, say anime, they'll know it's the cartoons. The word postal gained a whole new meaning after several disturbed U.S. postal employees went on shooting rampages, and the term going postal had a whole new sense than just a postal letter. In contrast, the RDF framework that the computers use will have to be much simpler and they'll be less, less flexible in the English language. But this is going to allow computers to process the question what does Jane do? 
and come up with an answer, Jane sells books. And hopefully, as this all evolves, we'll get into a little bit more depth than just selling books. Here's how the RDF triplet looks in pictorial form. You can see that our resources, Jane and books, is tied in with the verb cells, and that makes a statement. Now, remember at the very top of our layers for uh, what, what we're discussing here is the trust. Now, if we have the statement, Jane sells books from, say, a, tr a person that we know very well named Sam, we're going to trust that a lot more than if somebody named Morgoth the Vile that we don't know says, Jane sells books. So there's a trust factor in there. And we're going to have to find a way in order for computers to know that they can trust the sources. This is from uh, Tim Berners-Lee's web, web pages out on the W3 site. And he when he talks about the semantic web, he uses this example. Over on the left, you can see some RFD triplets. So these are the, the structures. And this is like people attending a conference. So for each person attending the conference, you would have their website for their home page, if they were attending or not, their given name, and if they have email or not. Now, you could also set up triplets with their location. Um, also, in their location, you would have a triplet that show their latitude, longitude, their zip code, or their postal information. And that's shown in the triplets in the red. And then there may be some uh, certain policies that build, are, can use for building uh, trust between entities, and that would be in the green triplet. And what Tim Berners-Lee has done here is he's combined these three layers of triplets and worked them on top of each other so we can get much more semantic information. We can see how these three different things interrelate with each other, giving us things in context. So we know that a person attending the conference, where they live, and what type of policies they're working under. Now, we've been looking at it in a human way, but here's how it looks to a computer. We basically use a specific XML structure, the RDF namespace, and you can see that here we have the description tag is the root. It sets about Jane. We, sell, we set up a namespace for cells, and we set up a resource for book. So now we've codified or made it into machine language so a computer can analyze this triplet and use it to, to compare and show relationships with other triplets. Let's go back to that URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. Here's some of them. You'll see an HTTP, FTP, mail to, HTTPS. There's uh, several of them. If you'll open up your web browser and go out to w3.org slash addressing slash schemes, you'll find a really long list of URIs, URI schemes. And what this allows is different ways that we can make identifiers so we can identify who Jane is. The word unambiguous. We, we don't want any confusion between different Janes. So is it Jane's Manfield, is it Jane Smith, or is it Jane down the road who sells books? By having a URI or a unique identifier, we'll be able to tell all the different Janes apart. Now, remember, a URI can be anything. It can be a book you bought last week. It can be your, your significant other, your pet cat. It's the foundation of the web. It's the URIs that hold the web together. Now, most of you are probably real familiar with the URL, Uniform Resource Locator. So that's how you find a web page. But a URI, URL is just one form of a URI. A URL identifies and locates a specific location out on the web. 
A URI only identifies something. It's a unique identifier. Maybe you could think of it something like a social security number or a house address. Probably more as a social security number because a house address would be more like a URL. Now, how do you create a URI? Well, you can create and publish a web page that describes the object. So I would use peterkjohnson.com as my URI. And because I know I'm the only one that has that web page and it identifies me. So this associates the object Peter Johnson with a URI. So can a URI be a URL? Well, this gets into the semantic problem, semantic web identification that computer scientists are currently arguing about. But yes, so I can say go to peterkjohnson.com and you can see my web page, but I can also use that in my triplet to identify Peter K. Johnson as a unique person. So remember, a URI is only a description. It's not a location. At the top of our layers, we have the logic layer. And the, and the human brain handles logic very well. So if we say Mary is a mother, and then we say Mary is a parent, then we can come to the conclusion that Mary must be a parent. Now, try to get a computer to understand that. And that's where ontology comes in. Ontology is a precise explanation of terms and reasoning in a subject area. So we can use ontology to get computers to act as if they understand the information they're handling. Now really in truth, all they're going to be doing is a triplet, moving all those little pieces of XML around, but the end result will give us something to look at that will seem as if they really understood what was going. Basically all we're doing is setting up lots of relationships between all these mirrored templates and we're talking about millions and millions of these little triplets, these RFD triplets. With ontology we can bring in the semantic thing so we're making the meaning so clear that a computer can understand it or at least utilize it. So yeah, the computer won't understand it, but it will be able to utilize it so we can see it and handle the data or the results. Now this ties in with the theories of emergence and the fact and, and the concept of systems theories. And this fact, and the thing is, is all these facts are stored out on the semantic web are going to change over time as the true state of the world changes. So as people change their triplets and add more information and all of this get all its communication happens then then the, a whole new system structure is going to keep, uh, be in continual e evolution one of the pieces about emergence and it's going to be true with the semantic web is that learning is not just being aware of information but storing it and knowing where to find it so there's where the semantic web is going to come into play. Now, when you can know where to find all this information, you're going to be able to recognize and respond to changing patterns. And the system itself is going to start altering its behavior in response to those patterns. So it's not a matter of just seeing information from a semantic web and seeing relationships, but the system itself, the whole semantic web, is going to recognize the changing patterns and alter its behavior. And now we're at the very top of the layers of the semantic web, which brings us to trust. Now I can ask you a question, who is the President of the United States? And what I'm really asking is, what is the name of the President of the United States according to the latest trustworthy data you have at this time? But when I say who is the President of the United States, I have an inherent trust in there that you understand that I'm really asking the longer question of the name of the President according to the trustworthy data you have at the current time.
Now, with the semantic web, the grand vision is that we're going to have better web communications. We're going to have better personal communications. But if you're going to see personal devices, desktop, laptop servers getting, in quotes, much smarter. Everything is going to be connected, but it's going to be connected in terms of relationships. So instead of just technology, we're going to have relationships and see how things interplay with each other. Um, the automation of decisions that had to be hand processed in the past, past are, going to, are going to be much easier to handle with a semantic web. One example is ordering a book. There's a really good uh, detailed description of that in the resources that I'll show you in a minute. Also, the ability to assess the trustworthiness of documents on the web will become very powerful with a semantic web. And the ability to find information and relationships much faster and with greater ease. We'll look back on the days of Google and the other search engines and kind of laugh when all we looked for was a few keywords and got matches for those keywords. So here's our layers again. We start with a basic alphabet, the Unicode, which is computerized. We build on top of it an XML structure. That structure is used to build the RDF triplets. Those triplets follow specific rules that are not confusing to a computer. They're, they're, they're not ambiguous, like our mind can handle ambiguous data that we're not sure about. Um, the computer can't, so we set up an ontology vocabulary to handle those triplets. We tie that in with logic and proof and trust, and you have the semantic web. So here's some interesting references if you want to learn more about the web and how it's developing. Sandra Hawk has done lots of work with Tim Berners-Lee, and she's put together this a uh, simple looking page, but it has great information. And in Sandro's uh, web page, you will see um, the example on ordering a book using the semantic web. O'Reilly Press has a web page out, the semantic web primer, that talks a lot of, in more detail of what we covered in this presentation. And finally, out at the RDF website, there's, they show how handling images on the semantic web. I grabbed a screenshot from the web page, and you can see that using SVG data, another XML technology, you can describe and connect images as part of an RDF. So here's two people that can be identified through an SVG XML document, as well as the beer they're drinking there in the yellow. And this can be, because it's in XML using SVG, it can be tied in with the RDF XML. So that gives you a brief introduction to the semantic web, how it's layered, and some of the things that it's going to bring out as the web continues to grow and change in the years ahead.